just noodling around with a little uh, chord chart. All of me, we uh, had a, we had a, what do we have? We had a happy hour on Sunday where we um, basically we had a meeting of all the people just to get together and have good vibes. And the, the rule was no classical guitar playing, but anything else goes. And so we had jokes, we had mice made out of handkerchiefs, we had a lot of artwork, which is really impressive. Uh, and yes, we uh, I played through a jazz chat with Evita, my wife, uh, sang through all of me. So it was just a nice chance to say hello to everyone and um, take our minds off things, relax, see some friendly, familiar faces. So thanks everyone, hello in the chat. <laughs> it's great to see everyone. Um, you know, it's, it's basically just CGC coming in here to say hello, so which I'm very happy about. Today, we're gonna be talking about identifying harmonies in music. Now, if you are in the academy, this is going to be probably familiar material if you've done the level one and level two theory courses. I think it's a really useful skill to have to be able to, you know, we, last week we talked about the Divise Prelude uh, by uh, Robert Divise. And uh, in that we talked a little bit about, and also we had, the, that's right, we had the presentation about learning a piece of music and we talked about analysis and how analysis can be um, something where people get a bit intimidated. There can be all sorts of interpretations of what analysis entails. But anything, in my opinion, it involves anything that enhances your understanding of a piece. And it can really involve many different aspects. And we're going to talk about one of those aspects today, which is identifying harmonies. A lot of our music um, involves triadic harmony in classical Western music. And honestly, if you compare it to some of the complex harmonies of um, either 20th and 21st century classical art music or jazz, uh, we actually deal with harmonies that are relatively straightforward, if not simple. But of course, subjectively, it might be simple to someone who's dealing with uh, very complex harmonies and chord changes and, you know, uh, tone rows and all these kinds of things. And uh, if we're new to it, then it's incredibly complex. So it's all very subjective about where you are on the path. But I think um, that it's going to be very useful for you as a classical guitarist. And um, I, I think it will help you further your understanding. So some of this might be old news to you. Some of it uh, might be a little bit above your head, you know, sort of might be not not quite ready for this. So I apologize in advance if it's not completely suited to you, but we do have to sort of pick a location. So a couple of people, so uh, hi Lee, great to see you again. Um, Lucien asked about the Sunday session. Well, the Sunday session, Lucien, was actually just inside the academy. That's a Zoom call, and so that's not one of these live broadcasts to YouTube. Uh, we actually have a lot of sessions inside the academy where we, uh, just for the members, and we can all see each other. So it's quite a different dynamic. Anyway, um, I'd, I'd be curious before we before we get started because I always like to uh, chat for a little while and get the ball rolling. I'd be asked. I'd be interested in knowing um, what some of the sort of where you're at with harmonics understanding. Where are you up with, with identifying harmonies in a score? Can you look at arpeggios and understand what triad that is? Do you understand how it relates in the key? Maybe the function of the harmony, maybe that's confusing. Or is it sometimes confusing? Uh, some, there, there are notes in there that don't make so much sense. You're sort of trying to say, oh, there's a C major chord, but what's that D doing in there? How does that figure out? So I'd, I'd be curious um, to know uh, where you personally are at with your your study. So please uh, write that in the the comments if you will. I'd be I'd be I'm gonna have to pick uh, a place in the sand as they say uh, for today. But um, I'd be very interested to see where you are. So everyone's still coming in. Um, and I'll wait, I'll wait for some of those answers because asking people where they're at with their harmony. But today we're gonna, I'm gonna actually do a screen share into Photoshop. Um, it's gonna be 
very, you know, I always I wake up on Tuesdays and Thursdays sometimes and say, what on earth am I going to talk about this afternoon on the live stream? But I have committed to the live streams, so I, I'll pick something and hopefully it'll be interesting. So Jerry says, harmony equals mystery. All right, well, hopefully that there will be some aspects about this that uh, uh, might help. Uh, James is saying he's got trouble with augmented and diminished identification. Yep. John had Harmony 101 in college. That was in 1968. So this will be a good refresher. This is probably uh, Harmony 101. There, there is in the level one theory course in the academy, we deal with something called scale degrees. And we talk about intervals with so the distances between notes and understanding scale degrees. It's in level two that we start looking at how those notes stack up into triads. Johannes uh, says that the simple harmonies are okay, but missing triad, uh, the seventh, um, it probably adds in a bit of confusion. Um, Martin said, uh, it's easy to see harmonies on a sheet music compared to listen and hear to harmonies. Yes, it's quite a different thing to hear harmonies versus um, to see them. Cashboy keeps writing about the level five RCM exam. Unfortunately, Cashboy, it can't help you right now. So I'd appreciate it if you might stop commenting about your level five RCM exam here, but maybe it will be of interest to you. Unfortunately, I can't help you uh, right now. Um, Michael knows about passing tones, enclosures, etc., but still difficult. That's okay. Well, that's, I'd say that's uh, another level step up. We'll be talking about passing tones today and neighbor notes and things like that. Um, Gislen asked about, uh, no, saying she knows how to identify a triad, but not have the reflex of doing it when I read a score. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that is another stepping stone, um, where, you know, it's sort of how we, we might feel familiar if we have a chord, if we've played a lot of folk songs or Beatles tunes or whatever, we have a chord. Even if we see someone's hand like that, we say, oh, that's a C major chord or that's a G major chord. A lot of that just comes with familiarity and uh, identifying them on the keyboard, uh, on the score, sorry, is really no different. It is familiarity and it just, it does take some practice. So today I'm, I'm going to be doing it a little Differently in that I'm going to be interacting with the questions throughout um, because this, this teaching is already in the academy and it's actually very structured in that level two theory course. So I don't think we're going to be cutting this up and putting it in the academy. Rather, it'd be a nice uh, option if you want to ask questions about what I'm talking about in the theory as we go along. All right, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to use this is the fanciness or the lack of fanciness is going to be Photoshop. Um, here we go. Let's try, is this going to work? All right. Okay, great. I can see that you can see my Photoshop. <laughs> um, all right. So I will try my best to answer questions as we go along, but, uh, this is, this is a little bit of an experiment for me, as it might be for you as well. Um, I wonder if, I wonder if actually we can, ah, you probably don't, you don't want, you don't want to see my face anyway. I was going to say I could try and get my face in there, but never mind. All right, let's start with, okay. So we're looking at taking a scale and here we're going to use C major. Often we use C major in examples just because it's nice and straightforward in terms of um, the, the notes that we're using. So the C major scale, as many of you know, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Uh, and these are the white notes on a piano if you just go in ascending order. And the nice thing about this scale is there are no accidentals, no sharps or flats. So it's just very simple scale for us to use, very commonly used as well. In the scale, we uh, talk about these with scale degrees, and it simply is C is 1, D is 2, E is 3, F is 4, G is 5, uh, A is 6, and B is 7. Now, 
Where we're going to start is by building up triads. And what we're going to do is, okay, if we start with a C as our root note of a chord, and then we skip the D and we, we go up a third and we take the E, right? Then we've got a third away from that C. If we continue this process, uh, do I need another space? No. <laughs> um, we, you can see what we're doing. I'm going to take the D. I'm going to start with that D. I'm going to skip the E and put the F up there. Then I'm going to go to the E. I'm going to skip the F and put the G. And on it goes. We're stacking thirds here. And for those of you who are OCD, I'm probably not doing it exactly <laughs> over the over, one over each other. And then, simply enough, we're going to do that same process one more time. I'm going to start with that E, skip F, and go to the G. C, E, G. D, F, A. E, G, B. F, A, C. G, B, D. A, C, E. And B, D, F. Okay, so if you look at it, from, let's see if I can, here we go. From this kind of grouping, we have the chord C, E, G. That's a triad, that's a major triad based off the first scale degree. And on the guitar, it would sound like, that's a C major chord. And as we go up, they're going to sound a little different because some are major and some are minor and one of them is diminished. But if we started with a DFA, we'd go... It's a D minor chord. And then EGB. Right here, that's an E minor chord. And when we get to the fourth scale degree, that's a four chord, that's a major chord. And then GBD. That's a five chord, that's a major chord. Then A, C, E, that is a minor chord. And then B, D, F, that is a diminished chord. So uh, that is, it's no more challenging than that really to stack these up. Now what I would ask you to do, because this is gonna become quite useful in the examples we're gonna go through. Uh, is could you on a piece of paper? Let me let me go back to uh, to me again. Hello. <laughs> uh, I would like you to do on a piece of paper this. It really, I want you to write out what I what I just wrote out. Okay. So it's going to go C D exactly what I wrote out. F G A B C it starts out like that. Right? And then you start stacking those triads on top. So you take the C, you skip D, and you add E above it. And then you skip the F, and you add G above it. it really, you'll start to see the pattern is relatively simple to create these triads and sort of harmonize that scale. So that's what I'd like, like you to do right now. I should play some waiting music. But instead of playing waiting music, I'm going to... Um, have a look at some, there's a couple of things that came. Richard was saying it's okay for him to uh, analyze, but you usually have to write it, write them out to recognize them, not yet instinctive. Kind of similar to Gislan, Gislan, um, yes. And then Jacques said different in harmony in jazz versus classical guitar, that's a mystery. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, we, we're gonna touch on that a little bit. Kerry said, also confused about inversions and how that plays in the harmonic structure. And then Ken says hello from California, hi Ken. <laughs> So, have a go at writing out, I'm gonna go back to my screen. Yep, have a go at writing out this chart for yourself because you're gonna be referencing it a lot. And in fact, if you wanna create something like that in a Word document and print it out on your wall, uh, for, and you can do it for each key, then that would be um, very useful. Um, okay, so there's gonna, there's gonna be some questions that'll come out that are a little asynchronous. Um, like so, uh, asking about the dominant seven chords, we will get to those. So please hold them in the pocket for a little bit um, and we'll continue on. So first port of call, I'm, I'm really interested in practical 
use of this. So we're going to take um, we're going to take. Sorry, this is going to be this is juggling. I've got all sorts of things with the comments and everything as well on the screen. We're going to take this chord C E G, right? And we're going to that's the 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 one chord. Uh, and we're going to look at a piece of music in C major, and we're going to go through and analyze it. We're going to find all the C E Gs. That's going to be our first port of call, so the one chord. All right. Wish me luck juggling all this stuff. Okay, here we go. Here we go. All right. This is so study number nine. Um, yeah. Great. Okay, so let's look at the first measure. Now this is not um, a trick question. These are not. This is. These are hopefully going to just be nice and straightforward for a while. So we see a C. That is a C. Next note. That's a G. Yes, that ticks the box for our C E G chord. That's a C. Yes, G. Yes, E, G, C, G. That is all. C major triad right there. Uh, nice and laid out for us, not hiding, not throwing any curveballs our way. Okay, next measure. D, a red flag already. That's not in the chord. The G is in the chord, but the B is not. Look, F, B. I don't think this is going to be a C major chord. Let's look, we're looking for low hanging fruit here. Okay, let's keep going. C, yes. G, yes. E, yes. That's the triad. C, that's a C. That's what we're looking for. But the G and the E are not in order. That's okay. They don't need to be in order. They, they can be out of order. Still makes a C major triad. And I'm just going to play these two blue bars for you. So the first one. It's just taking that C major chord that we know so well and breaking up the chord, uh, the uh, notes. The effect is that those notes ring over one another so that we can uh, get a, it's a C major arpeggio. Same here. All right? Now, are we looking for C major still? We see a B. Nope. G. Oh, possibly. C. Oh, interesting. C sharp, D. No. See, what, what ends up happening... Oops, why was I coloring it blue? Uh, what ends up happening is we have to put a little bit of a detective cap on when we're looking at these things. But here we are, we are on pretty clear ground. So C, oh, this is the same as the first measure, so I'm just going to go ahead and go C. All right. Uh, G's and B's and F's? Nope. What about this? C, yes, G, yes, E. Spot on, C. Okay, all oh, that changes. That's all right. It doesn't have to last for an entire measure. It could last for a portion of a measure, and that's exactly what happened here. Okay, uh, G, nope, G, uh, there's a B that's a throwing away. So lots of Gs there and Bs. All right, continuing on. B, nope, nope, nope. If it looks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Um, so it's, And that is not the C major duck. C, G, C, G, E, yep. Okay, I'm gonna. I, I think some of this is getting a little repetitive, but let's go ahead. And see, da, 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 yep. Sharps and A's, nope. D's and F sharps, nope. F's and B's, nope. A, B, C, E, nope. F. Da, 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 da. Oh, what about this last one? C, E, G, C, C. Yes. So you can be quite confident in making a guess that if you are in a you know, standard classical piece of music, and I mean classical from the classical period. Um, so, you know, 1685 through 1750, or even the Romantic period, which is sort of early Romantic, late classical. So uh, after 1750 through to, you know, mid 1850s, you can be very confident that you are going to find a lot of one chord. So here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven measures almost. Uh, out of a 16 measure piece is made up of the one chords. Great. That is some analysis already. We've already broken up the 16 measure piece and identified some common common stuff. Okay. Let's go back to our scales. All right. So that that was that one chord. Now the other big important chord in western classical harmony is the five chord. Many of you know this. Uh, maybe some of you don't. And if that's one, two, three, four, five, the five chord, um, which is 
the dominant chord, also known as the dominant, sometimes these chords have different names, which can be confusing, is G, B, D. So we've got C, E, G is the one chord, and G, B, D is the five chord. Are there any notes that overlap in these two chords? C, E, G, G, B, D, the G overlaps. That's common between those two chords, but the other two notes are different. Okay, armed with this knowledge, let's go back to the score and uh, see what we can see. G, B, D, that's the five chord, that's what we're looking for. Okay, back to Saw, our good old friend, Fernando. Um, okay, now, C, G, C, that's the one chord, we'll see all the one chords. D, G, B, G, that is a five chord. A couple of things that are happening here. There's a, first of all, there's not a G in the bass, and there's also an F in here, and we are going to talk about that. So there's two things here. There's a slightly uh, confusing uh, bass note, and then the F as well. Let's keep going. B, G, D, G, B, G. Yes, we've got the G, B, D, and they've got some interesting notes in there as well that's confusing me, but yes, there's, it's sort of an overwhelming majority, if you would, uh, and we're going to call it a G, but there's some interesting notes we'll have to look at and figure out later. Now here, oh, this is a nice easy one, G in the bass, G, B, D, but there's that F again, okay, we'll come back to it, D, C, and F sharp, nope. Okay, so you get the idea. I'm going to keep going through this now, this is the same as the beginning. Da, da, da. Well, that's a short one there. It's only two beats, and then it changes. And then a short one there as well. Okay, so hopefully you can all see this. If you cannot see it well enough, I might try and zoom in uh, a bit more. Um, so, But you can see from this overview that we've got almost the entire piece is one and five. Uh, which is really, uh, it makes up the bulk of the music we deal with. All of this amazing music from someone like Beethoven or Fernando Saw, honestly, the, the bread and butter of this music is one and five. And you can see it here, colored in, that uh, it makes up the majority of it. So we had, I told you we were going to deal with this D and this F. What is going on with that? Okay. Now, Let's deal with the F first. So we dealt with uh, um, one and five. That was the five there. And that was the one. Now, this is five, seven. And the seventh chord comes from continuing this process that we started, right? If we have these triads and we do one more step, we actually end up getting a seventh chord. There's an F, right? So we've gone G, skip a note, B, skip a note, D, skip a note, F, G, B, D, F. That gives us what we call a dominant seven chord. It is the dominant harmony. It's that sound that you often get um, in the barbershop quartets. And the reason we use it so much uh, in classical music is it has a very strong tie back to C, back to one. The B wants to go to the C. The D wants to come back down to the C. And the F could either want to pull up to the G or the E. They're all uh, absent from this C chord and they pull back. So B wants to go to C, and the D wants goes to C, and the F wants to go to E. So they're all pulling like magnets back to the C, the one chord. And this is what we have with um, the functional harmony is a tension and relaxation. And I talk about this a lot when we're um, interpreting pieces of music. So just to, just to hammer this home, so to speak, here is that F and 
funnily enough, it goes down to the E. Because that is a nice voice leading F to relax down to E. Blue, and these colors were not accidental, for nice and relaxed. Orange for a bit more intensity, and then back to relaxed. Now, and if I just play that with that ebb and flow there, relax, tension, relax, tension. There, someone asked uh, in the comments or made the comment, got the theory, want the application. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is an application right there. If you understand the tension to relaxation, uh, that is one application of the theory. It tells you harmonically how to interpret or one way to interpret the music. It doesn't have to be that way, but it's a good guide. Tension to relaxation. Now, one thing I did not deal with um, is this D. Why on earth are we calling this a G chord? In fact, it's a G7 with that Seven, that's a five, seven. Why are we calling it a G, but there's a D in the bass? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> These chords here are still the same chord if you jumble up the letters. So if you take, oops, lorem ipsum, C, E, G, that's called root position, and that's our C chord. But if you go E, C, G, it's still a C chord. And if you go G, oops, let's go, stay with the capitals, G, uh, E, C, it is still a C chord. They are all C major. They are in called what's, uh, they are in <laughs> what's called an inversion. So we've got C, G, that is root position. And we've got E, C, sing that high that's a first inversion and then if we take if we're looking if we take that G we start the G at the base that's a second inversion now why on earth would we use those inversions because they sound different from one another and why would we use different hues of blue uh, because they're different from one another. They provide variation. And also, as we'll see, they provide um, voice leading. Now, in this music, if I were to say, you know what, Fernando, I think I can write this better. And I don't know why I use the D there, because we're clearly playing a G7. I'm going to put this down to a G. It would sound like this. what it would sound like bom, 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 one five one but as it's written now it's a little more singing C D C D G you know so there's a bass note G here so it makes it you can have more interesting lines in Look, and here as well, we've got this orange. That must be a G. In fact, it's a, it's a G7. But it's on a B, not a G. Then, so we've gone from this is a first inversion to a root position C chord back to a first inversion. So that sounds like this. Uh, well, B, C, B, C. If we had it in root position, it would sound like this. G, C. I think uh, the inversion is more interesting. And if you start to get more sort of uh, inventive, let's say, with inversions, you can actually create melodies out of these lines. So I'm going to play G to C to G to C. To G. I'm just going to keep alternating and I'm listen to the bass line and listen how I can make it go into steps. just using inversions. All I'm doing is jumbling up those letters that we found here. Jumble, jumble, jumble. And that gives us actually a huge amount of 
variety and variation that we can incorporate in our compositions. And that's exactly what Beethoven did and Bach did and Saw did. They didn't need to use every single harmony under the sun. In fact, they didn't. They stuck really to a lot of um, familiar harmonies, shall we say. But you can still get a lot of beauty and variation and inventiveness just out of that. <sighs> okay, already at 4.30. <laughs> I've got like five other pieces. Clearly, I'm not going to get to them. Um, okay, so now I've got some other chords here, but let's let's go back to our saw piece and see what else we can see. Let's have a look at these blank spaces. Um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cherry pick. I'm going to ask you if you have written out um, already in your uh, your sort of chord. Um, can't talk and do things at the same time. If you've already written this out in your chord, what is this? What what harmony are we looking at here? It's got an F, an A, and a D. Have a look at your chord chart, and um, first person to answer in the comments gets a round of applause. A silent but glorious round of applause. What harmony is that? And then for the bonus round is what chord, if we're thinking Roman numerals, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, what chord is that? So we've got the name of the chord and also sort of the function of the chord. Remember the blue is a one chord and the orange is a five chord. So what is that green? We've got an F, an A, and a D. And I know there's a delay on this broadcast, <laughs> so I have to gas bag until I can see some answers coming in. Du, 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 du. Julie says second. Um, Hannah says two. What about uh, what? Well, actually, Ju Julie, you are spot on, and you get the uh, you are getting the round of applause. Uh, Brent says lowercase two in Roman numerals. Yes, that is uh, how we would identify it with the functionality of Roman numerals. Absolutely. And uh, I see a D minor. Martin also gets a round of applause because we have a D minor. Yes, it is a two chord. If we go back to our, sorry for all this jumping around. This is as good as good as I can do. Uh, if we go back to our thing here, we got D F A. That's C is the one chord. D is the two chord. D F A. That's a D minor harmony there. And the tricky part was it didn't start on a D in the bass. Um, I believe it had an F, right? And now, here's for the uh, other... <laughs> Dave Belcher has given the wash hand symbol, which is now conflated with applause symbol around the world. Um, uh, right, so this progression here, D minor, G, C, that my friends, is ye old 451. Right, what am I talking about? <laughs> Gosh, 251. 251. Now, the jazz players in the audience will be saying that is the bread and butter. 251. Uh, and there are, there are reasons that a 251 progression is so uh, powerful. And the reason is, I'm going to say it quickly, but don't worry if it sort of doesn't make too much sense, is that the D is a fifth away from the G and the G is a fifth away from the C. So we have this powerful kind of circle of the fifth thing going. Yes, and James also said it's first inversion. Absolutely, D minor, first inversion. The saw is cheeky and he makes us wait all the way to the very last note of the entire piece to get that lovely resolution onto the final bass. C. So, two, five, one. Now, the other ones in here, we have some more complexity. Now, <laughs> actually, this makes sense. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over this a little bit because uh, it opens up a conversation that's a little 
gets us a little off track. But this here, I'm going to put it on fluorescent green. This is also D, C, and F sharp. Hmm, now that's curious. Now we run into a couple of problems here. But I'm going to just skip over a couple of those problems. First of all, to say that this is also a D chord, but it's a D major. That F sharp makes it major. And remember I said that the D is a fifth away from the G, so it has a powerful pull, kind of like this G has a pull to the C. So this is the five of the five. And we will, if we have time, we can get up to that. That's called a secondary dominant. And all it's really doing is adding extra direction to this chord, saying reinforcing this chord. So you've got uh, the beginning of measure seven. That F sharp really wants to go to the G, because we're ending on that G. So it's kind of like a 2-5, just like we had 2-5-1 at the end, but it's a 2 on steroids, if you will. Loose analogy. Anyway, that's not the more important one. The more important one that we, we are really going to start having questions about is down here. What is going on here? This will be a question for the masses. Uh, I'm going to use purple because I can. Uh, purple. Okay, here we have A, then a B, then a C and an E. Now, question out to the audience, what harmony is that? This is where we start getting some roadblocks in terms of or just confusing aspects. What is that B? How can we have, I mean, we're talking about pick a note, skip a note, right? But what's that B doing? Because that's, that's A, B, C. So what's happening with that B? What, first of all, what, what harmony is it? Can anyone in the audience tell me what harmony it is? Let me, let me play you from measure nine as we're waiting. happening what what harmony is this purple what is the purple Michael's got it Michael you don't need that question mark there you are totally correct and the answer is a minor with a passing tone yes SB is that Scott I'm not sure who that is uh, I just see SB uh, six chord with a passing note absolutely so what are these people talking about with a passing tone um, well, that B, the, the chord tones we have here is A, C, and E. And if we go back to our thing, A, C, and E, or actually if it's even in root position, A, C, E, that is a six chord, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, it's an A minor chord. Now, what on earth are the Bs doing there? All those people answering in the comments are quite correct. Uh, they are passing tones. A passing tone, let me find a color for you, or at least something. Mm, I'll make it, I don't know, let's make them red because they're giving us trouble, trouble tones. <laughs> oh, did I just click, is that an eraser? What's going on? Anyway, whoa, come back. Oh, it's, sorry. I'm having Photoshop difficulties. Here we go. This B and this B, right? So the first one, we've got a chord tone that's an A, and then the next chord tone is the C, and the B is passing between it. That is a passing tone. It's a good name for it because it's nice and descriptive. Uh, now the B doesn't really pass to anything specifically, but um, it's just kind of neighboring this other note. What it is, is just adding in some interest. Now, if we just use chord tones for the entire piece, we do start to lose a bit of interest, right? That's this last four, uh, 
three measures if I took out any of the non-chordal tones. Fine enough, but this is more interesting. Thank you, Mr. Saw. So that passing tone is one of the non-chordal tones that we want to be aware of because it's going to throw a spanner in the works when we're trying to understand what a harmony is. So you see notes that don't belong could be a passing tone, passing between two chordal tones. Now, we said this was weird before and it still is weird now. This is not a trick question. You can answer it for yourself, but we don't need to answer it in the comments. What are these notes? We've got Right? We, we established this as a G major chord because it's orange. And now we have these notes that clearly are not in the G major triad. They are not a G, a B, or a D, or even an F. It's a C and a C sharp. What's happening here is once again passing tones. We've got a B, which is a chord tone. And then we go in chromatically, climbing up to that D. And it's just adding in a little bit of flavor, a little bit of color, literally here with a red. So. Um, Notice now, with, with just that little bit of chromaticism and the passing tones, how refreshing it is to hear it in the ear from the top after we've just had arpeggios. Oh, it's very welcome and a nice spice of variety. So, I see a couple of questions, and I see that someone said, stupid question, of which there are none. <laughs> Uh, why a B? Can we use any note as a passing tone? That is the least stupid question I've seen all day. So thank you for that question. A passing tone can pass between two chord tones. So if we have, um, if we have the notes in this chord, in this case it's A and C and E, there are two quite obvious passing tones. We've got A, B, C, going from A to C, that passing tone will be a B. And then if we wanted to go from C to D, the passing tone is going to be, I'm sorry, did I say C to E? Then the passing tone is going to be D. So that would say, let's say I'm going to change here, I'm going to recompose it. I did is I put a A C D E. I put a passing tone between the C and the D there. And to reinforce this answer here, we can see that the chord tone is a B, chord tone is a D. And not only did Saw use a C as a passing tone here, but he also used a C sharp. There's I think another good example down here. It's a little more congested. This is not such a good example because it's actually chord tones. Um, I, I did mean to get into more complex pieces, but it's taking me a little longer to explain these things than I had planned on. I must break this, I think, into some other presentations. So that's a passing tone. Um, so that we can get onto another piece, I do want to say that. Uh, These two chords here are also like this. They are secondary dominance. If you know anything about the circle of fifths, if you think if we're starting at A major on the circle of fifths, A, if we're going anti-clockwise, next is D, next is G. It's going around the circle of fifths. These are secondary dominance. It's a little bit out of the um, scope of what I'm talking about now. So have we covered everything in the piece? Mm, yes. Yes, we have. We've got tonics. We've got dominants and dominant sevenths. And that's most of the material. Then uh, we have some secondary dominants for flavor. Uh, and then also here we have the two, a two, five, one progression. And a little bit of chromaticism here and a couple of passing tones. So that is, uh, that is what makes up this piece. Um, I do, yes, I, we will definitely do another session. I actually have um, 
Dave, Nikki, and myself will be doing a session on Thursday, but maybe next week, next Tuesday, we can continue this um, this discussion as we d dive in deeper. But I want to get <laughs> um, I want to dig in a little deeper because just to flash ahead a little bit. We have the two chord, we also have a four chord, and this is the five of five down here. So that's actually referencing that secondary dominant. But I wanted to start getting more into these. These are the non-chordal tones. So non-chordal tones are things that are gonna crop up in a piece of music, but they are not part of those triads. We have the triad, triadic notes are these ones up here, right? They're triadic notes. And if we have a note in a measure that's not one of, with belonging in these triads, it can really confuse us, having us not understand what the harmony is. And so to arm you with some detective tools, I want to tell you about these non-chordal tones. We already just did the passing tone. Now, let's see if we can spot a neighbor note. Um... Let's have a look. I should have done one of these. Here's one I prepared earlier, but I'm actually digging in. Oh, he, this, this will definitely have some. Okay. Too easy. Neighbor notes all over the place. If you want to find a neighbor note, just ask Johan. He's got neighbor, no, neighbor notes coming out the wazoo. All right. This is our beautiful prelude. Not in drop D. And you know what all of those notes are that are testing your slurring capabilities in that prelude? They are neighbor notes. So if we were to take the D major scale and do exactly what we found here with these notes and just stack them up, then we would know that the first chord in D major is comprised of D, F sharp, and A. And lo and behold, what do we find? I'm still on green, how about that? What do we find here? We have a D, check. We have an A, check. And when an F sharp, check, check, check. And then these are also Ds and As and F sharps. The only one that's giving us grief, that little, I can't say naughty words, this is a family friendly show, <laughs> uh, that little sneaky devil, that E is throwing a spanner in the works when we're like, oh, is it uh, a D9? No, it's not that complex. That, see, that's the, that's the path that these notes tend to throw us off on because you could argue if you stack all those notes you get that E on the top and you get a very jazzy harmony so that other people might say oh it's a D9 but no when we're analyzing this music we try and ignore it because it is not a passing tone but it's friendly neighbor a neighbor note so we have the greens are chord tones and here instead of passing from F to D Rather, it goes away from the F and then comes back. So if it were a passing tone, it would sound like this. But as it's a neighbor note, it sounds like this. And could it be a neighbor note in the other direction? You betcha. In my best American, what would that be? That'd be kind of a Midwest kind of thing. It could be this. Yes, that absolutely could be a neighbor note as well, going up instead of down. Now, I said uh, Bach is full of neighbor notes. He sure is. They're everywhere. He loves that minor second, that neighbor note, or a major second, as in, in this case. Um, so, you know, someone also, I can't remember the name of the person that asked about practical application. Well. That helps us understand what actually is going on in the chords. And what I love bringing out in this particular piece uh, is this middle line here. 
A, B, oops, no, I didn't need to do that. A, B, C sharp, D. You could also bring out the neighbor notes. You're starting to understand things that tie together. You could go, so here's the A, B. tones and neighbor notes if, if you've got this score at home just go to town you know this would be a great one because uh, a lot of these harmonies exist for at least two beats if not a full measure and the you know everything in between is just neighbor notes and passing tones a uh, good friend of mine years ago said you know what Bach is nothing more than arpeggios scales and sequences <laughs> you know and to some extent it's true um, Okay, so there's the non-chordal tone and neighbor note. What do we have? The other non-chordal tones. Uh, suspensions and drones. Interesting. Okay, because we were just there, I'm going to deal with the drone. Can it, will it, do it let me do this? Nope, it's going to be... Uh, let me see if I... Give me a second, I'm going to clean this up. Oh, look at that. Okay, now, we're going to look at this and say, okay, D major, great. And then the next one, well, that sounds familiar. G, B, and D, that's a G major chord. Great, too easy. What? Que? Que pasa? That is a C sharp and a G and a D, and that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. In fact, it's very beautiful, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So what is going on? What, what is throwing us off here? You know, if I were to guess without Western classical harmony, I've got a one and that G is actually D, E, F sharp, G. That's a four chord, one, two, three, four, D, E, F sharp, G. And then, you know, I'd be willing to bet, even if I'd never heard this piece before, I'd be willing to bet there's a five or a five, seven in there. And this is probably it right here. But what on earth is that D doing there? Because in a A7 chord, we've got an A, C sharp, E, and a G, the barbershop quartet, but there's no D. So what's going on? Well, that is one of our other non-chordal tones throwing a spanner in the works. And this is a pedal tone, also known as a drone. D, 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 D. And we finally get the beauty, beauty of uh, pedal tones, of pedal notes is that, you know, one day, when they finally change, it actually is very a nice harmonic release. So that D stays throughout the whole introduction and we have to disregard it in certain instances. And that goes for this. If we were to play without the drone, it might sound like this. So what we have is this drone, and this here, which is an A7 chord, that dominant 7 chord, is made more confusing to understand because of that pedal tone. But if we take out the pedal, and we see a C sharp and a G, and we know it's just before a 1 chord, we can make an educated guess that that's a dominant 7. Okay, I'm... Starting to lose my voice again. Here we go. Let's go back to so we name a drone pedal. I'm skimming over these a little quickly. Last one I'll deal with is a suspension. One of my favorite non-chordal tones. Here we are. This is an easy one. The Bach one we we jumped right into the deep end of the pool there. So sorry if that threw anybody. Now. Uh, One sharp, key signature of both G major and E minor. Starting with the bass E, G, B, E. I'm going to put my money on E minor right there. So E, G, and B is the triad for E uh, minor. <laughs> and we have E minor all the way along. Now, if we went back and did one of our harmonized scales, 
we would find out that the four chord, the fourth scale degree, if we stack them up, uh, hang on, what am I talking about? Excuse me, <laughs> my brain is starting to, uh, the two chord <laughs> would be F sharp, A, and C. F sharp, A, C. And we're gonna get a one, two, five, one, just like our two, five, one from before. But once again, we have a spanner in the works. What is this G doing here? If we look at this chord, we might say, oh, that's an A minus seven. Oh, well, I don't know how to call that. It's not really the uh, F sharp that we were thinking of. Um, well, what that is, is a suspension. This is another non-chordal tone that comes up often and frequently, and that is a tautology. Um, so what it's done is, and this is a textbook suspension right here. Um, I need some, how do we make this smaller? Here we go. We have the G, which belongs in the E minor triad. That is the preparation. The G stays into the next chord where it does not belong. It is suspended across the bar line from the previous chord into this chord, and then it resolves down into a chord tone. Preparation, suspension, resolution. It is such an important one to know musically and harmonically because it gives us guidance of how to shape the music. If we thought that all things are equal. We might play we might play it with an accent on the downbeat, but we want to bring out this, this relaxation. Remember we talked about tension to relaxation? This note does not belong, therefore it creates tension, relaxation. expressive and it comes up so many times in music. Here's another one. This is unprepared, but I don't know. That's not a, excuse me. I, I, I misspoke. Uh, hey, just for bonus question. These are all chord tones. These are all chord tones. This is not, it's a G and a B7 chord, but it's passing between two chord tones. What is that called? Yes, passing tone. All right. You can probably see I'm starting to lose my mind a little bit. <laughs> it's hard talking to nobody. I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back now. All right. So, today. Is anyone still with me? Oh, great. We've got some people still here. Today, <laughs> today we covered uh, triads. We covered triads. We briefly looked at inversions, the jumbling up of those triads and why they might be useful. We looked at the one chord, the five chord, the five seven chord, and we started to become acquainted with the two, the four, the progression two, five, one, starting to look at those. And then we looked at some non-chordal tones, which are those tones that are not in those triads. And they often can, um, they can often throw us off on our detective mission to figure out what the harmonies actually are. Those are non-chordal tones. And if you can start to identify non-chordal tones, you are well on your way to understanding the harmonies so that you can identify them quickly. A lot of people in the beginning said uh, that, you know, we can, you can do it if you spend some time with it, but it's not that easy to figure out on the fly. Well, um, I will say that it comes with time. Uh, and I will also say that personally, from my own experience, I was at university doing this and things just didn't click until I would say about the second or third year of university. And the point of, point of me saying that is give yourself some space and time to let these things sink in. And there is a deep connection to how you play things, but it's not always immediately obvious. A lot of it comes down to um, 
understanding repeated figures, repeated gestures and the functions of harmony. Certain parts of it can be very academic and cerebral and you can appreciate them just on kind of a almost mathematical and structural way. But a lot of them are often very practical, like suspensions, non-caudal tones. You probably won't accent those. Um, uh, what were the other ones we looked at? Uh, sorry, non -caudal, well, passing tones and neighbor notes, you probably won't accent those. Drones. You can understand when a drone uh, is present. Drones are kind of amazing. I like to do this because I will take the pedal tones, right? It really suspends your location. You can almost do anything. It's like a magnet. It's like a tether ball. <laughs> you are the ball and you can do anything around it, but you're tethered to that drone, that pedal. So it's an amazing uh, tool to uh, take some very exotic harmonic tangents. <laughs> so, um, well, thank you for tuning in to yet another live live lockdown session. Um, appreciate your attendance, appreciate your attention. I very much enjoy these and it will be very lonely without you. <laughs> so on Thursday, uh, <laughs> on Thursday, um, Dave, Nicoletta Todesco and myself, Dave Belcher, I have to say the full name, Dave Belcher, Nicoletta Todesco and myself will be talking about um, the things that we noticed through this round of exams. We had 127 exams submitted and uh, we learn a lot every time about how we can better instruct, how we can refine the curriculum, things that might fall through the cracks. Um, and we're going to be talking about all those types of things that seem to be some common aspects. We have certain left-hand tendencies, certain right-hand tendencies, um, and we, over time, we've dealt with them. And I think the standard, every, every submission after submission period gets higher and higher and higher and higher because not only do we deal with them that way and sort of bring light to some of these issues that are repeating, but we also, you know, just everyone as a group, I think, is uh, the standard just keeps on rising. So that's what we're going to be doing on Thursday. We'll have a Skype call and uh, it will be great to be joined with uh, my illustrious colleagues. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm just seeing if there's any questions. So Jenny, yes, the, the five chord, G, B, D, seventh note was F. Yeah, absolutely. The reason we call it a seven is if you take the bottom note, the root note, it doesn't matter what chord it is, and you kind of count up from there. So the root note is one. You skip two and put in three. Skip four and you put in five. You skip six and you put in seven. That's why it's the seventh. So. My suggestion now, if you have the energy, the time and the inclination, is to go ahead and take some C major pieces by Saw and Giuliani and identify this, this would be what I ask of everybody, regardless of your level, after seeing this. Identify one, the C major chord, the one chord, and identify the five, the G major chord, or, or it might be an F in there, it might be a G major seven, or a G dominant seven. So those two um, is what I would suggest you do. And then everything else is gravy, as they say. If you can identify other things, that'd be great. But my suggestion is go ahead right now, reinforce some of this information with pretty much, well, 
if you have, if you're in the academy, I will tell you some of the pieces right off the bat that will be great in C major. Uh, study number one of uh, Fernando Saw Opus 60. Study number, study number two will work. It just is more complex. Lots of passing turns there. Study number three is interesting. This is Opus 60, Fernando Saw, um, because we're intimating harmonies. This is something I might talk about uh, later, is where you can actually suggest a harmony, but there are no harmonies. I'll give you, I'll give you a taste test of that, seeing as I always kind of get, I don't want to end these sessions because uh, I enjoy them. Um, but the idea of imp not intimating, so that's the wrong word, implying a harmony. harmony is this. Can you hear it? We've got C, we're in C major, and then what are we doing here? That is a neighbor note, E, and then we go to G. So study number three is an interesting one because yes, you can definitely identify a lot of ones and fives in there, but there's no stacked notes at all. It's single line melody. The Waltz by Fernando Crowley in grade one would be a good one for G major if you want to try your luck in another key. Same would go for the Aguada Waltz. How about anything else? Oh, here we go. Study number eight and number nine in grade two, upper 60. Um, they would be excellent candidates. We, we already did one. Andantino, Carcassi, spot on. Etude one, Giuliani, little more complex. You know, pr pretty much grade one and grade two are gonna be good candidates for this. So, there you go. So, that would be my charge to you, is to uh, do something now just to, while it's fresh, because these are the kind of thing you have to get it processed a little bit. Um, Carrie said, here we go, I'm gonna put, put you up. Another, on another subject, I would be interested to know about the vocabulary like cadence, half cadence, and identifying the difference. Great. So uh, again, teaser, teaser for next time perhaps, we talked about two five one, right? That's when we have chords in a in, in a progression. They, that's it's called a progression. It's a series of chords, and uh, we give names to the relationships between these chords and the functionality uh, because it's kind of like shorthand. We can identify a chord in isolation, but if we start identifying how they interact with one another, we call that functional harmony. Uh, and that means that given certain rules, which we do very much abide by in this type of repertoire, they have roles to play. C, we go to G7, comes back down to C, and that five, seven to one is a perfect cadence, it's functional harmony. So that's, yes, we can definitely talk about um, cadences and functions, it's really just naming things. For instance, we, we all know I like analogy, um, uh, and Narayan recently highlighted some of them <laughs> in his great exam. Uh, five to one is a perfect cadence, very powerful integral to the music we play. You could say that is a parent child, right? Let's father, son, father, daughter, mother, whatever, it, that powerful. Four to one, still strong, not as strong. <laughs> you can start coming up with ideas. So that could be uh, uncle, auntie, right? Relative minor, could be a cousin. So, you, so, the, so what I'm saying is that you've got four people, right? You've got Mary, 
Steve, Ishmael, and Nasindra. <laughs> I tried to diversify my main my name choices instead of Mary and Steve. Um, and in isolation, they have they have their, they they are who they are. But when we say uncle and we say father, daughter, grandfather, we start to understand how they relate to one another, and we can also make assumptions based on those relationships. So, all right, well, Dave, Dave is piecing out, so I guess I better piece out too. Um, but thank you, everyone. Always enjoyable. Stay safe, be well, um, and I'll see you on Thursday. And you'll also see Dave and Nikki. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye.